BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 95, Emotional Contributions to Ill Health. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging, covering treatment and solutions that include bioidentical hormone pellet therapy, safe and affordable skin rejuvenation, and spa quality botanical skincare. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health, and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome. Today we're going to talk about the mind-body connection. You know, usually we talk about the body and what we can do with, with hormones to balance the body. But we, to be truly healthy, you have to have both your mind and body balance. Your emotions, how you think, how you act in the world is just as important as having your body balanced, but you can't have your mind balanced unless your body is balanced. It's kind or of vice the versa. vehicle yeah. to get you to the healthy mind. Yeah. So I'd like I'd like you to talk about that today. <laughs> okay. Well, I will talk about some of it. Uh, I mean, it, it's my field, uh, and and in my field, we talk a lot about the, what's called the Cartesian split. It comes originally from uh, a French philosopher named Rene Descartes, who said in Latin, "I think, therefore I am." Uh, and in the development of Western thought from that moment on, there really has been a separation from a respect for information that comes to us from our body, information that comes to, from, to us from our uh, emotions. It was more empirical. Uh, it was more what's the evidence, what's the data, let's problem solve, let's stay cognitive. We are rational animals, that whole rationalization movement. Mm -hmm. So Western thought kind of moved away and that's from medical thought. I mean, an, an emphasis on, you know, what, what do you get from feeling? And men in particular, uh, men in our culture are acculturated not to pay attention to their bodies. Mm -hmm. And so you ask a lot of men as a physician, have you ever had mm -hmm. this illness? Have you ever taken this medicine? Are you allergic to this or that? Uh, how do you feel when this happens or that happens? If you have to qualify your pain, you know, can you rank it one to 10? And they look at you and that's why you have their wives come in. Because yeah. their wives will come in and yeah. go, oh, he can't take Tylenol and he had his appendix out. With, and the guy's looking at her like, thanks. He doesn't know, he doesn't track it. <laughs> They, I ha they fill out the men's forms, and yeah. I'm like, who filled out your form? Did you yeah. fill it out, or oh, did your no. wife fill it out? No, because the wife fills it out. I need to know that. <laughs> or the daughter. If the wife is doing yeah. the daughter fills I know, it because, I know. But you know that's why we have daughters. It's a to, rampant problem. To, exactly. <laughs> so the point that we want to make as, as we discuss this in these podcasts is that the balance, the harmony of the mind-body connection is important. And an example in my work that I have seen over and over through the years this is the example of ADD mm -hmm. and, and whether or not uh, parents should consider when, when an appropriate diagnos uh, diagnosis is made, should you consider putting your kid on ADD medicine? And so many families historically have come in with an emotional, uh, emotionally driven objection to medicating their mm -hmm. children. Those teachers just want to medicate my child because they don't want to deal with them. Mm -hmm. uh, or I don't want my kid to be on medicine. It's that whole John Wayne, you know, Smoke them if you got it. Suck it up. Be tough. Men have to, you know. It's usually the fathers that oh object yeah, more than the mothers. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's usually the fathers. Although sometimes the moms mm -hmm. agree and support mm -hmm. that. And so what I say back to them is when it's the right thing to do, it's so immediately known that it's the right thing to do. The results are right there, mm -hmm. and, and you can see it. And especially with younger children. The challenge is you know, your child has to swim the river. There's no way around it. He has to swim the river. You're going to tie his hands and tell him to swim the river. If, if you don't, you don't give him the treat medicine. Him. If you give him the medicine, at least his hands are untied. And so what we've focused on so much in our work has been the process of untying the hands. What is the physical balance, especially for women who mm -hmm. are postmenopausal and their hands are tied because their bodies aren't working at maximum efficiency. So the quality of life is limited. Right. So your whole mm -hmm. professional focus is on how to untie their hands on the physical domain. Mm -hmm. My focus is on how to untie their hands on the emotional yes. domain. So we have the mind-body split, and mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. So if you untie your child's hands, then he, the medicine can control what's racing in his mind so that he can become more socially aware, mm -hmm. more cue-based awareness. Learn. He can learn <laughs> how to develop relationships, how to control himself, how to present himself, and so on. Mm -hmm. And those are things that all of us have to learn. And that keeps 
the other kids from rejecting him and the adults from rejecting him. And there's so much lifelong damage that's done. I and mean, we talk to people about compensatory strategies. Mm -hmm. If you have an issue, you can't just say, tough, you have an issue. You have to say, all right, how do you cope with that issue? How do you compensate for that issue and move ahead? So that, so that brings us to a theoretical foundation. And I'm going to talk today from the theoretical foundation of a Freudian perception. Right, and which is what most psychology and psychiatry are based on, is based historically, on. Historically, although there's as many theories out there as there are therapists. And so if what I have to say today doesn't strike you as hearable, go find somebody else and look at their explanation. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not invested in that. I just want to give you a cognitive map for, for how I understand it. And I, I had to go back over this because I see this every day. And when I went back over all of the patients that I've had that have come in mm -hmm. and they have physical problems and they have emotional problems and maybe severe emotional problems, I have to look at this balance the way you describe it before I can then treat them. I was kind of doing it on a gut level in terms of I'm going to make you physically better and then your mind will be easier for you to start adapting to your environment. Yeah. But I didn't really remember, although I did have this foundation, remember the actual steps that it takes and actual definitions, which I really want Brett to tell you today because when you're listening to any kind of erudite speaker and they're talking about why we do what we do, they use these terms. Yeah. So it's very important to understand the terms and, and the way you explain it is very easy to understand. Well, so that's so. why I'd, I'd like you to start with that and then we'll go to the dysfunction. Start yeah. with the function, go to the dysfunction. And, and remember, it's empirical. If it doesn't work for you, don't use it. Use something mm -hmm. else. Uh, the theory is that it, it, the personality theory of Freud is the id, the ego, and the superego. And the theory is that when a human baby is born, it is at that moment in time a fully developed id. The id is the primary part of the personality that is developed. And the id in the theory is uh, solely focused on immediate relief, immediate gratification of any need, desire, or impulse. It's totally amoral. It never considers, is it right or wrong? It never considers, what's the cost? Mm -hmm. If I do this, what will it cost it's me? Just, I want, it just I says, want, I, want. I want it, and I want it now. Mm -hmm. And theoretically, they say that the id never sleeps. So most of your dream construct mm -hmm. comes out of the id. Uh, when you're born, the ego, which is the second of the three levels, begins. The ego is the conscious, rational, decision-making, executive part. The job of the ego is to choose. I can do this or I can do that. And initially, when you're a little baby, the, the ego is enslaved to the id. So when the baby's mad at mom and says, <laughs> you know, mom won't give me what I want, whatever that might be, uh, then the id says, slap her, bite her, <laughs> kick her. And that's... we have to teach our children that's not appropriate. You can't get your needs met that way in a functional, helpful way. You, you may get them met, but it's going to come at a cost that eventually you're not going to be able to pay. And you explained to me in a simplistic, more simplistic just thing to keep in your head is that the id is the I want and the ego is the way to get it, the movement. Right. The, id, the, 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 the id doesn't have any legs. It can't. If, <laughs> the id can sit here and say, I want that a apple pie. The ego has to get up and go get it and, and mm -hmm. find a way okay. to get it. Excuse so me, miss, can I have that pie? You know, yes. It has to solve the problem. That's its job. Mm -hmm. So uh, initially, first three, four, five years, the ego has to catch up with the development of the id. Mm -hmm. And it has to learn how to operate so that it can satisfy the needs and how to start to calculate the cost. And so a little child learns you don't bite mommy when you're mad. Mm -hmm. and, and parents and teachers are constantly saying to little children, you have to use your words. You can't kick, you can't hit, you can't bite. You Which have to use you your words. Which is why you do have to discipline Express your children. Yes. You can't just go, oh, oh do whatever you want. You must know. Well, that's the parents they don't know. and teachers' jobs to Babies help them learn know. how to control themselves. Right. So then you have the ego. And the day you die, the ego, if you're conscious and alert, will still be trying to learn, assimilate data, make good choices. Mm -hmm. So the more successful you are in life, the more successful your ego has learned to help you through 
the conflicts that occur. We always have conflicts. You mm -hmm. cannot get through this life without having anxiety and conflict and pain. So that's a normal day. Anxiety, conflict, and pain for all is of us. normal for all of us, and it's how we deal with it. How we deal with it. And how we understand it is necessary for me to deal with it. I have and, to understand and so we want to maximize why I feel our that opportunities. way. How do I position myself to get the most out of it with the least damage and the least cost? Well, anxiety is a motivator. Anxiety is a, a, yeah, a way that we are motivated to change something or to do something. So all of our defense mechanisms come out of the operation of the ego. The ego finds ways to satisfy the imbalance or resolve the conflict. And the, the better it is, the more options it has, the more sophisticated it is, the better job it does. Right. So the, the defense mechanisms of like repression and rationalization and uh, avoidance and denial and, and there's, there's half and we'll the, explain all those. The, well, <laughs> if they, you don't they come in categories and uh, hierarchically in terms of the level of sophistication and the level of energy that's required mm -hmm. to use them. The first category is flight or fight. Mm -hmm. If, if you, you you avoid it, if it makes you uncomfortable and and it's causing you anxiety, if you can, you avoid it. Little kids know that they're either going to stand and fight or they're going to run. Yeah. So that's something that we still use as adults. Yes. But it's something, usually we've developed other ways to deal with things, but we still can use that when we get desperate, we go to fight or flight. We regress back mm -hmm. to, to the primitive, developmentally primitive in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. so, so you have the ego, and then around four or five, the theory is you develop a superego. And in some theories, in the Gestalt theory, it's called uh, the parental introject. And it's like a prepackaged tape of values that gets inserted. And you can never change it. It's locked in. It's a sealed tape. You will always hear that voice. And you know, the voice is, is often in your mother's voice, but it's your parents, it's your church, it's your, your school teachers. It's, it's, it's all those television. people that have told you <laughs> this is right and this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And there are no gray areas. Mm -hmm. And so you get that little, oh, you'll go to hell. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. That's a sin. That's forbidden. Mm -hmm. And so the job of the, the ego is to make the choices to try to resolve the conflicts. The best thing I've ever seen to demonstrate this is an, is an old movie uh, called Animal House. And, <laughs> and in the movie, there's a, a scene where uh, one of the young fraternity boys has an underage town girl at a party. And, and she's gotten drunk and she's passed out. And mm -hmm. so he's having a debate with himself. And on one shoulder is a little character of him that's a devil. <laughs> that represents that. the id mm -hmm. saying, go for it. You'll enjoy it. She'll never know. There are no costs. <laughs> Do it now. On the other shoulder is the angel saying, what if it's your sister? What would you say to your mom? What if she gets pregnant? And in the middle is him, the ego, saying, well, how, how do I quiet this debate? How do I find a way forward that mm -hmm. satisfies what I need. And we do that every day. We do that every day <laughs> in, a, in a million ways. And so that's, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And how does it tie into biobalanced health mm -hmm. and the, the hormone uh, replacement theories that, that you work on and try to do? What, what has to happen, I believe, is that we maximize the physical functionality by replacing the hormones, by by taking the body and getting it tuned so that it works as well as it can work. Mm -hmm. And then we need to also maximize the emotional functionality. How do you deal with relationships and how do you solve problems? When we all develop coping sick, strategies. We go all the way backwards to avoidance yeah. and all the things we did when we were children, things that we just learned early on because we don't have the energy to do more. So when I start seeing people, right. I start seeing them and they're basically surviving and they're basically using Just hold on, poor, white knuckling. poor modes of dealing with problems. Right. And as they get better, their emotional side can get better if they're looking inside and if they are not, if they don't have some other damage, which <laughs> you'll talk about next well, time. So in therapy, we're always looking for patterns. Uh, mm -hmm. I listen to you, I talk to you, I watch you, I ask you about, you know, how do you understand this? How do you feel about that? And what I'm looking for is what are the patterns that you use in your life to get by? Mm -hmm. What are your coping strategies? What are your defense mechanisms? And as I said earlier, they come in levels of sophistication. Mm -hmm. And so as you age and become more mature and more sophisticated, you develop these really complex ways of problem solving and, and taking care of mm -hmm. the conflicting demands mm -hmm. of the id, the ego, and the, and the superego. But when, the, when you have a lot of stress, 
and your coping strategies are not competent to handle it, maybe because your body's not giving you the energy mm -hmm. and it's, it's out of whack, then you regress and you go backwards in terms of the level of sophistication and the kind of coping strategies that you use. And what I have found in my work is that people generally regress back to what we call a globalized defense. The, 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 uh, the, we call it the law of the hammer. If you give a three-year-old a hammer, he discovers that everything's a nail. <laughs> you know, he just has one tool yeah. and he uses that tool for everything. Mm -hmm. And so you regress back to what you did as a child that worked under maximum stress to hold you together. And, I, and I'll give you a personal example. For me, I grew up in a, in a violent alcoholic home. The, there was a, a small place, there were a lot of people in it, and they were all rageful. It was a scary place to be. I learned that I could go away from all of that by reading. Mm -hmm. And so I learned to escape into reading. And that has secondary gains, secondary payoffs. I could escape mm -hmm. that immediate moment of emotional distress and violence by reading a book. I could go mm -hmm. any place, any time in the world, or in the future, read mm -hmm. science fiction. It doesn't matter, I can go away. So I pick up a book, I focus on the book, and I go away. But I read for information and enjoyment mm -hmm. and entertainment, so, so that's a good. Mm -hmm. So now, I always have a book. I have a book in the car, I have a book in every bathroom in the house, I have a book next to my bed, I have a book next to the, the couch on the, where I watch TV, and I'm always reading it. If we go shopping, I take a book, tell my wife to go shopping, I'll sit right <laughs> here, and I'll read. You come back when you're ready, and I'm content. But what we have learned, what my wife has learned, and I really, we've been married 27 years, and, and, and what she's learned is that when I need to escape, when I'm not dealing with something, when I haven't got it in focus, mm -hmm. I read obsessively. I read to withdraw and run away. I don't mm -hmm. read for entertainment, I don't read for pleasure, I'm reading to escape. Mm -hmm. And she's learned how to invite me to look at that. She doesn't accuse me, she doesn't attack me, she doesn't really increase good. my anxieties. Mm -hmm. She says, it feels to me, <laughs> as if you've gone away into reading, is something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I always say, oh no, I just have a good book. <laughs> but in 27 years, I've learned she's never wrong. Uh -huh. And I will go inside, as soon as she leaves, she's like, oh, okay, and she leaves. She's very gracious mm -hmm. about that. But I'll go inside and I'll look, I'll think about it, and I'll know she's right. What's really bothering me. Yeah, because, because then I can refocus consciously. I can bring the ego back into play to say, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I avoiding? And what do I need to take care of? And, and I'll go back later and tell her, I said, you know that question you asked me, you were right. This was going to, and she's very gracious. She never, she never says, I knew it. She says, oh, Thank goodness. thanks for telling yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> thanks know? for telling me I was and, right. And that's helpful. So part of the challenge may be, and it's hard to do for yourself, mm -hmm. ask your partner, what do I do? How do I escape? How do I take mm -hmm. care of myself? And it could be anything. It, it, it could be road rage. It could be drinking, it could be shopping, it could be exercising, mm -hmm. it could be sex, it could be reading, it can be... It could be lining up the cans in my pantry, Absolutely. which is what I do. Yes. I just, or if I can't control everything, things seem to be flying out of control. You try to control I something. I can control my closets. Yes. And a lot of <laughs> and people... And I can line everything up and throw out stuff that I don't need, and, and, and then I feel a little better, but then I go, what's bothering me that much that I just cleaned out every closet in the house? Yeah. You know, and, and, and so you've that, learned, I learned to do that to recognize the cue that mm -hmm. you've regressed, that mm -hmm. you're doing this globalized defense. It's always happening for some reasons. Yeah. What are the reasons? It's not just because it doesn't I just happen spontaneously because yeah. you you yeah. walk by and said, oh, I think I'll clean the closet today. If you don't know about yourself, ask your partner, ask your friends because they know you. You might find it easier to look at your wife or husband and say, I think I know what you do, but don't do it assertively, mm -hmm. aggressively as a, as a criticism. Do it as a discussion to say, this is what I perceive, this is what I think you do. How does that sound to you? All of this is normal. Yeah. We, all have, we all do this. Well, we, all we just have our have own conflict. particular way. Conflict and anxiety. In, in my field, we talk about three types of conflicts. You have approach-approach conflicts, mm -hmm. approach-avoidant conflicts, and avoidance-avoidance conflicts. Approach-approach, you have two good choices. You want to do them both, but you can only do one. Uh, I have an invitation to the White House for dinner. I really want to go. I'm a former social studies teacher. That would just be so cool. cool. I like to do that. And I want to take my family to Disney World. We, both things are of equal value in our family. What am I going to choose? I can't do both at the mm -hmm. same time. Uh, that's approach, approach. Mm -hmm. You have to find a way through. You have to find a solution. That's the job of the ego. Uh, a, a, avoidance, avoidance. I have two bad things. Mm -hmm. I have a prostate cancer diagnosis and I'm 82. 
Do I do surgery and become incontinent? Uh, do I have all the other issues of that? Or do I just wait because the stuff I'm reading now says most of the time you'll die from something else before you'll die from that. So there's real there's questions out there. anxiety and worry with, that anxiety goes along with not doing anything. Anxiety and worry about anything. what to do. So again, whatever the right answer may be, you have to find a way forward that works for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then approach avoidance mm -hmm. is there's something I really want, but I don't want to pay the price for it. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to buy this really big house, but I don't want that mortgage. You know, so how do I find a compromise that quiets my anxiety, reduces my conflict, buys me a, a big enough, nice enough house at an affordable enough cost so that I'm not staying awake nights or uh, being cash poor or having to eat baloney because we live in an empty house with no furniture, but it's huge. You know, all of those things are things that people struggle with but all the time. But you learn that and you teach that as a parent. You learn, I mean, if you had great parents, your parents taught you to make choices. Yeah. What I see all the time with my patients is they're exhausted because their children are in three activities at the same time. They're exhausted. They don't yes. force their child to make a choice. What do you like to do best? Do you like art class? Do you like soccer? Do you like public speaking? I mean, what do you want to do? And they don't make them make a choice. So they grow up as people who can't make a choice between two good things. And that's not healthy either. Right. But eventually, they'll have to learn to do that. Your and kid, it might make them anxious. Your kids need non-structured quiet time. They need to be on their own resources and have to figure out how to entertain themselves and not escape into electronics or athletics or uh, activity of some kind. And, and, and you need and so quiet you. time too. <laughs> <laughs> and you need time to exercise and you need time to do things for yourself. So, so when all of these decisions come up, stop and think, what am I doing? Ask your child to make the decision. What decision would they make? Ask them. And then say, well, you have to you give them parameters. This is what our parents did for us or should have done for us. And one of the most and primitive, it makes us good people. <laughs> one of the most primitive coping strategies that we use when those anxieties are mm -hmm. with us is put something in our mouth. Oh, yeah. Smoke or eat or to drink. soothe, uh, make yourself feel better in the short, immediate moment. So and stop doing that and think, why am I doing this? Why am I going to the cupboard and going, oh, is, what is there to eat? Oh, the refrigerator. I know yeah, that very store, well. You go graze at the store. And, and you find yourself, you're not thinking about what you're eating, you're just eating. In fact, you don't really log it in your brain. That's why I make people write it all down. Yeah. So it does affect your brain, affects your body, your body affects your brain. It works both ways, and we have to tend to both sides of it. And awareness is kind of interesting. It's like having a mystery to solve, like, what sign am I? What sign, sign are you? It's like, <laughs> what dysfunction what? or what There's function? your sign. Yeah, there's you got, your sign. You got a big bologna sandwich in your mouth. There's your sign. <laughs> I don't think that's the stars. I think that's how you cope. Okay. But, um, but we will use this information that we talked about today, mm -hmm. and then we'll go forward and talk about dysfunction, things, yeah. things you'll recognize. You'll go, oh, I know, that, that's Joe. Patterns. Joe does that. Yeah. Patterns what of behavior. What happens when the machine breaks? How, how do you know that it's broken, and, and what's going on there, and how do you fix it? We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. Follow Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Brett Newcomb can be found at brettnewcomb.com.